Five, four, three, two, one. Pop short. to a brand new episode of the One Puck Short Podcast. I'm your host, Ron McGregor, and it is Wednesday, the 27th of January, 2016. Kind of a rapid-fire show this week, flying through a few little bits and pieces that are going on around the NHL and also the British Elite League. I will start in Montreal, where the slide continues. A lot of pressure on coach Michel Therrien, but general manager Mark Bergevin has said Therrien will remain in charge of the team until at least the end of the season. And not perhaps hugely surprised by this, with Carey Price out, things have been difficult for Montreal. And a few people, uh, maybe throwing barbs is is not the right term, but looking at the goaltending, and Mike Comden and Ben Scrivens have come in for some flack. They've not been brilliant per se, and if we look at how things measure up, Price went, well, he left the game, on the 25th of November when the Canadians were taking on the New York Rangers. Condon finished that game. So running from November 26th through to today, Montreal have played 27 games. They've given up 83 goals, which isn't good. Condon's had some howlers. He's not had nights to be proud of on one or two occasions. But in that same span, Montreal have scored just 53 goals. And I find it quite hard to lay... A significant portion of blame at Condon and Scriven's door, notably Condon who's played 21 of the 27 games uh, at their door, at their feet, when the club is scoring less than two goals a game. You know, you go through that 27 game run and games in which Montreal scored three or more goals, well, three goals and they've still gone on to lose it's twice. They've, you know, they've lost two games where they've scored three or more, and they were both four-three losses to Philadelphia and St. Louis, respectively. I mean, how is that Condon's fault that, that a team can't score more than, you know, two goals? Nine, well, no, sorry, ten goals came in a three-game span over Christmas and New Year. They scored four against, I think it was the Lightning. They scored one in their next game. They scored five against the Bruins. So of those fifty-three goals, ten of them <laughs> came in three games. That's like twenty percent of their goals. I just it's it's unfair, I think, to to lay so much blame at, at Condon's feet. Again, he's he's not had the the greatest run per se, but you compare his you know numbers to, to Henry Lundqvist. Not been great during that same period either since this the end of November, and he's only marginally ahead of Condon statistically. But the Rangers are winning by hook or by crook. They're finding ways to score goals, and I know some people don't think the Rangers will be able to last under their current kind of run of good luck shall we say but Lundqvist wasn't been great which he was at the start of the year that was the big thing for the Rangers at the start of the season was that Lundqvist was outstanding he's dropped off a bit but they still found a way whereas the Habs just they just can't score they now finish for the all-star break their next game is on February 2nd and P.K. Subban was booed last night by Montreal fans they lost to Columbus who are the worst team in the league right now well, Subban scored from just over the halfway line, but there were turnovers that led to goals, there were some bad penalties, and even he admitted that if he'd been in the stands, he probably would have booed. He probably would have booed, and Montreal just keep sliding down. Well, they now 2 7 1 in their last 10. That's that's brutal. They've dropped now to what are they? 11th in the East. Lost two in a row, 11th in the East. They're three points behind Pittsburgh, having played two games more as well. So. You know they're in tight now. They're in that knife fight that you know Andrew Berkshire and I touched on a couple of weeks ago, and Andrew guested on this podcast, and, and we talked a little bit about the Canadians, and they were sliding then, and it's just got worse since then. Really, Mark Bergevin has said it's on him. A few people have said, well, you know, he should have gone out and got a better backup goaltender in the summer, but you know it wasn't a great depth chart goaltending wise for for the Habs. But when you have Kerry Price, who can play 60, 65 games a year. And you look at Condon and Tukarski, was Tukarski was still there, obviously, at the start of the year, and it's like, well, we've got two guys here who can play between them 10 to 20 games spread out over the course of the season. And I think Condon would have been capable of playing odd games here and there, and certainly when Price first went on the shelf, Condon initially was very good, and then he had a slight wobble, Price came back and got hurt again. But, you know, those those couple of games, you know, Condon looked good. It was when the workload started to increase that he started to struggle, and... 
if your offense has given you a cushion of two goals per night on average, that's not a lot to work with. And at the best of times, there aren't many goalies who will be able to succeed in that kind of environment. Price is one of them. You'd say Lundqvist most of the time will be one of them. Holtby maybe. You know, there's a very small number. Luongo, so you, you've got maybe half a dozen guys, depending on, on your point of view, who could thrive in that kind of setup. And as I said, Price is one of them. He's extremely hard to replace. And just looking now with hindsight, saying Mark Bergevin should have gone out to sign someone, it is easy. But again, you know, when it came to July 1st, he would have sat there and said, we have Carey Price, who's just won the Hart and the Vesna, and we have two guys who, between them, should be capable of backing him up through the season, and then we have Zach Fukali in the system. Again, not the greatest depth chart goalie-wise, but not hugely terrible, all things considered. And it's easy to say they should have gone after Enroth. Well, Los Angeles were in there pretty quick. They signed him on July 1st. The Flyers have been interested in Michael Neuwirth for some time. And I think from the Flyers' point of view, that was a sensible option with Steve Mason. That kind of 1A, 1B thing going on. It, it helps Mason and it helps the Flyers to have those two guys. So it's all very well throwing barbs at Bergevin saying you should have done this, you should have done that. People using terms like reliable backup. What the heck's a reliable proven backup? What does that even mean? You know, Peter Budai was what you'd call a reliable, proven backer. But I don't think Peter Budai would excel in Montreal right now. You know, they, they, as I said, they just can't score. Their power play has created, their offense has been poor. Hopefully they haven't lost Max Pacioretty for too long. He got hit in the face last night against the Blue Jackets by a Subban shot. It really was not PK's night. But, you know, this, this is just a team that can't score. Uh, and there's too much blame, I think, being portioned to the goaltending for that. Again, Condon's had some bad nights. But if you're a team who are only scoring on average two goals a game over that span, you're not going to do particularly well. And the record they've compiled during this 27-game span, granted, it may change slightly if they had Nenroth in there, but I'm not convinced it changes that much because they've lost one-goal games. You know, they've lost two one-games. Well, that's not particularly horrible on Condon's part or Scriven's part to give up two goals. And But if they still lose because you've only scored one, it, that's not Mike Condon's fault. He can't score the goals as well and... Obviously, again, we talked with Andrew Berkshire about the use of Galchenyuk. That remains a hot-button topic in Quebec right now. They keep playing him on the wing, even though he's shown some real promise at centre. David Deharnay has been used in some pretty interesting ways, and Lars Eller as well. It's it, it's bizarre. I understand why Bergevin has stood by Michel Therrien, as I said. It's very hard to fire a guy when he's been asked to play what's now just over a quarter of the season. It could be up to half the season without his best player, an elite goaltender like that. But the pressure's on in Montreal, and the blame and, and the barbs are being thrown in the wrong direction, I think. And if they miss the playoffs, I think Terry probably does go in, in the summer. And Bergevin might be under pressure too. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out for the Canadiens. But right now, I think people are looking in the wrong place and apportioning, or a lot of people should say, are apportioning blame in the wrong places. Sticking with the Atlantic Division, Alexander Barkov has signed a new deal with the Florida Panthers. I've got to say, this is a pretty impressive piece of business by Dale Talon. Six years, $34.5 million for Barkov, $5.9 million cap hit. He's played extremely well for the Panthers this year, alongside Yarmie Yaga and Jonathan Huberdeau. That top line has been really effective for them. And to get him locked up for, for six years like that, they eat into two years of unrestricted free agency. Apparently, they offered him an eight-year deal. Barkov didn't want to take that, which you can kind of understand for a young guy who started his NHL career so well he, he wants to explore what unrestricted free agency might be able to offer him down the road but this is great for the Panthers really really good they've got Bukestad and Barkov tied up now for the next well Bukestad's deal kicked in this year so they've got five years of Bukestad and Barkov as their one and two centres Ekblad will be up for renewal next year but again they could lock Aaron Ekblad up and have their number one demo and their top two centres signed for the long term who uh, Barkov, sorry, has 13 goals and 31 points this year. He's third in team scoring behind Lime H. Yaga and Jonathan Huberdeau, who has 34 points at the top of the chart there. So uh, the Panthers, are, they're in a good place. They're in a really good place. And a lot of people have talked them up this year. They're top of the Atlantic right now. And they have to undergo an absolutely phenomenal collapse not to make the playoffs. They're, they're pretty much in, in so many respects. They're eight points away from dropping out of the playoff picture right now. So, you know, it'd have to be a pretty spectacular collapse if I only surrendered 108 goals. And I know a few people have pointed at their advanced stats that they're not a great position team, which they haven't been. But, you know, they're finding a way this year. And if Jared Galank can find a way to improve 
you know, certain areas where they do hold on to the puck a little bit better over time. I mean, this is a young team, largely. I know Yaga's age-defying, as it were, and there's a couple of other guys like Willie Mitchell who they can probably dispense with, if we're honest, in the summer. But the core of this team is young. And now with Barkov signed, they've, they've got it locked up on some great deals as well. So absolutely fantastic deals. The big thing for them moving forward is goaltending. Luongo's been brilliant this year. I think maybe he should be under consideration for the Hart and the Vesna. I think Holtby's probably got the cachet to take the Vesna. But in terms of most valuable player to his team, Luongo's right up there right now. But what they do between the pipes moving forward, it's hard to say. Especially as this young core will probably outlast Luongo. But, you know, he's generally been a healthy guy through his career. So there's a couple of years left in Roberto Luongo. Yet, yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see how things pan out for him and, and the Florida Panthers this year. As I said, potential heart candidate, as is, in my opinion, Evgeny Malkin. He scored his 10th career hat trick against Vancouver on Saturday. And he's been very, very good for the Penguins for most of the year. He did the whole Mark Messier, I believe, will make the playoffs type speech the other day. And, and he, as I said, when a lot of other stars, Crosby most notably, perhaps, have struggled, Malkin's been, been excellent. Pretty much the whole season, he's got 23 goals and 47 points in 48 games. Crosby coming up fast, he's on a seven game point streak, he has 41 points now with 17 goals. But you know, Malkin kind of carried a lot of the load when the Penguins were struggling early. They've been much improved on special teams since Mike Sullivan was installed as coach, and they're now inside the playoff places. You know, they've, they've had a, a really strong turnaround, they were kind of hovering around a little bit anyway, but. A few people expect them to be better than they were. Flurry maybe bailed them out a little bit early. They're now inside the top eight. They've got 55 points. The Islanders have only got 56, so they could catch the Islanders, though New York do have a game in hand. Uh, and maybe even make a strike at the Rangers in second in the division. I don't think anybody's catching the Capitals at the top. They've got 73 points, and they're now 14 points clear at, at the top of the Metropolitan Division. So... You know, and that crazy, you know, the crazy stats go over Tanya with the Caps. They've got 73 points. They lead the entire NHL. The next nearest team is Chicago with 70. But Chicago have played seven games more than Washington. That, that's kind of bonkers. I think uh, the President's Trophy might be going to the American Capital this year. But but I, I digress. As I said, the Penguins are in a much better place all of a sudden. You know, it's not a phenomenal record per se. 5 2 and 3 in the last 10, but they have won three in a row and got themselves over that home. They've passed the Devils now. They have two games in hand on the Devils as well, so it could put some distance between themselves and New Jersey. Carolina are in ninth. They played 51 games, so they have an advantage on the Hurricanes as well. So interesting times, I think, in the Atlantic and Metropolitan Division. As I said, Malkin and Longo, in my opinion at this stage, should both be under consideration for the Hart Trophy. Swinging back to the Atlantic, really, Jonathan Drouin's situation doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. Most people seem to be of the belief his relationship with Tampa is now broken beyond repair. Elliot Friedman mentioned it in his 30 Thoughts column, and I think the, the exact wordings he got from one source was no freaking way when he asked if the damage could be repaired between Drouin and the Lightning. So it really depends on how much of a distraction Tampa Bay feel this is and what Steve Eisman wants in return. Because he could play a patience game if he wanted to. Drew Ann is under contract until the end of next season and he'll be an RFA. So as we've mentioned on previous episodes of the podcast, Tampa hold a lot of the cards here. But if they feel it is becoming an undue distraction or they can get somebody in return who could really help them, maybe they start thinking about moving Drew Ann closer to the deadline. That situation continues to be monitored quite heavily by anyone and everyone around the NHL. Moving west... And Andrew Ladd appears to be becoming available, already available. The Winnipeg captain hasn't struck a new deal with the Jets. A lot of people, including Ladd, uh, expected something to be done by, by now. Ladd said this week that he thought that he and the club would come to an agreement. He apparently wants somewhere in the region of $6 million per season for around six years. He's not had the best year, though, and, and the Jets are starting to slide down the standings there, bottom of the central division right now. And that's a tough division to be in, uh, but they were kind of there or thereabouts for a little while, but they're now eight points shy of the playoffs. They do have two games in hand on Colorado, who, who currently hold that second wild card spot, but there's a lot to recover, and Ladd himself has not been great this year. He's become the target of a lot of fans. Uh, I, and, and, you know, as the captain, that kind of focal point, he has 10 goals and 27 points this year. 
after putting up, was it 61 points he put up last year, while playing with a sports hernia. So, you know, you can understand why people may be expecting more of Ladd having had off-season surgery. Yeah, 24 goals, 62 points last year. So you can expect understand why people expected more of Ladd this year, but, you know, he's on course to have one of his worst years since breaking into the NHL. And he's a guy who could help teams, though. You know, the, the Jets now apparently seem to be making a real run at re-signing Dustin Bufflin. They've tried to do a bit with Ladd. They couldn't get it done. And uh, people are reporting that general manager Kevin Chevaldeoff has been seen kind of cozying up with Bufflin's people. And to be fair, I, I would, of the two, I'd probably keep Bufflin anyway. Who else is there like Dustin Bufflin in the NHL? There's no one. You know, the ability to play as a forward or D, the way he plays the game, the ability he brings, and sure... There are ups and downs with him occasionally, and he's had his off-ice issues in the past, as anybody who has ever driven a boat drunk may attest to. <laughs> but there's no one quite like him, I don't think. He's a fan favourite, and as I said, what he can do along that blue line can't easily be replaced, even with some of the, the decent young guys that the Winnipeg Jets have got coming through. And... You know, Lad may be replaced. Well, Nikolai Ellis got a hat trick against Arizona last night, and, and they've got good guys. Nick Patan, Lowry, you know, Lad may be expendable as a result of that. He's, was he, 30 now? So, you know, he's got good layers left in him, and he could help someone towards the deadline. He could probably recoup something useful for Winnipeg moving forward. Um, what his future is, I don't know. I think somebody will, will pick up Andrew Ladd, as I said. He's only 30, and he's won two cups, and, and you know, proven himself to be a pretty useful gritty NHL player with, with a you know, offensive upside. So I think he'll find somewhere, but it doesn't sound like his home will be Manitoba for much longer. Another change in the NHL comes with their off-ice stuff. NHL Game Center is set to become NHL.TV. This is part of the NHL's work with uh, Major League Baseball Advanced, Advanced Mechanics. I can't remember the exact name. And it doesn't surprise me that these sort of changes are coming in. They're streamlining the website a little bit, making it a little bit cleaner, and you know, just generally trying to bring the game forward a little bit. As Greg Washington noted on Puck Daddy, that a lot of NHL fans are quite tech savvy, so they you know, they want things that are going to work on tablets and phones and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, this is a part of that change. This is part of why the NHL got into bed with uh, MLB AM. And, you know, it's going to change the way people people look at the games, I think. They're introducing NHL Premium, which is kind of like, for those who are familiar with the NFL Red Zone, it basically allows people to watch the last five minutes of any game, and it's $3 a month. So you can tune in to the last five minutes of any game you want, and as people follow on Twitter and things, they're going, oh, you know, the Jets and... Uh, Hurricanes are having a good game right now, or the Kings and the Sharks are tied at one with five minutes to go, or it's 4 4 in Edmonton between the Oilers and the Flames, or something like that. You know, people can, $3 a month, they can tune to, to those closing moments of the game. As I said, NHL.tv is what the rebrand of the Game Center is going to be called, and they're up in the frame rates, which is positive, I think, for anybody who tries to watch frequent on a, on a tablet or on a laptop or Apple TV because there were delays between, say, Twitter and the game and things like that that frustrated a lot of people. So that's all part of the MLB Advanced Media stuff. I said Advanced Mechanics before. That was Guy uh, Guy Pierce's character's company in Iron Man 3. Um, so, you know, there's real positive changes, I think, coming here. You can follow favourite... or sorry, you can favourite a team but you can also follow others so you can keep up with news on you know, multiple teams, even though they're not necessarily your favourite. As I said, there's stuff built in there to work better with the tablet. You've got mobile box scores uh, with actual content in which I know people like rather than just being a random 2 1 3 2, blah blah blah. And NHL.com gets a, a, an overhaul. So uh, there is a, a good piece on it by Greg Washinsky on Puck Daddy, which kind of you know, sums it all up, and uh, as he's kind of said, one of the other positive points is the NHL network will, will keep making little positive steps forward. So, yeah, that's coming February 1st, that all starts to change around. I know a lot of people are intrigued by that. I know it means some changes at NHL.com, which a few guys who write for there are watching keenly to see what it means for them. But in general terms, for fans, it sounds like it's going to be quite a positive step, and I know a lot more of it will be displayed in Nashville this weekend during the All-Star Game festivities. 
switching across to the Elite League now. And uh, quite controversially, I think it's fair to say, the Elite League put out a statement today regarding illegal streaming. I'll just read the, the statement out. We would like to remind all fans that it is illegal to stream any portion of games without prior permission from the league. In recent weeks, there has been an increase in the number of occasions when matches have been shown using the app Periscope. This is a breach of copyright and will be taken very seriously by all clubs in the Elite League. Anyone found to be live streaming games without prior agreement will be banned from attending games across the league. As a league, it is important we embrace the ever-changing world of social media, but at the same time, we have also to protect our product. And this upset, well, upset's probably the word, but it, it caused a stir and a number of people weren't particularly happy with this news or this decision by the Elite League, feeling that they are maybe stuck in the past or they are potentially limiting their audience. So people who maybe Periscope, you know, part of a Belfast game for argument's sake or a Brayhead game because of followers they have on Twitter or maybe people searching for hockey on Periscope, they might find that feed, they'll see a little bit of Elite League hockey, they might think it looks quite good and they'll go to a game. So I, you know, I understand all these points and the idea that a league, any league, has to move with the times. And I know, kind of, the NHL was criticised when they banned Periscope for for the same reasons. Though the NHL, of course, has much different television deals to the Elite League. And and you know, as I said, I, I get why people are questioning this or why they think it is a bad idea for the Elite League to kind of close its doors a little bit like this but equally i see things from the elite league's point of view as well because periscope footage isn't always the best so it doesn't necessarily show the game in the best light i know some people said well you know it's a kind of a pish product anyway well it's getting better each year and you don't want to showcase that improvement on grainy mobile phone footage so i kind of get their point there i also get that they want to try and protect something they have sold the rights to to premier sports and that might lead on to other things in the future. And Seth Bennett was on the show uh, recently and, and talked about, you know, trying to have slots on Sky Sports News and things like that. You know, he talked a bit as the perfect five minute to the hour kind of highlight slot. But if these highlights are appearing on uh, Twitter and Periscope and social media before these broadcasts go out, well, it kind of diminishes their value a little bit. And it's pretty hard to maybe trying to negotiate with Sky Sports News and say, you know, we can give you this, this and this. And they can just say, well, we can just go and pull that off here or look at the footage that's going out that people are sharing around. It's not good. And, you know, I get all this. I also get the point others have made about webcasts. Now, again, this is a kind of a two-pronged thing. You've got the for and against. Not every elite league club has a webcast. Some people feel the webcasts are overpriced. And whether you agree with that or not, that's an opinion some people hold. And... This is where it starts to get a little, maybe a little hazy as such because people believe the webcast costs too much. So this is a way to access content for free and you know share it around and engage with the league and keep up with what's going on. There's a couple of other people said if 10 people don't subscribe to a given webcast, that's circa 50, 60, 70, 80 quid that doesn't go towards the webcast, that maybe doesn't pay towards equipment or towards the commentators you know, beer money if they get that and, and some guys don't I know that for, for a fact they don't get a lot in return some guys so yeah, that all comes into it of are you I know David Majimsey from a view from the bridge put it as taking food out of people's mouths or off their tables maybe that's slightly extreme but the point he's making is fair that if you're jumping onto Periscope to watch these things rather than science or webcast, you know, you're you're taking money away from a product which is, you know, there to help fans engage and keep up with what is going on around the league on a given night. So I get that. There are other grey areas, you know, what if somebody sees a situation brewing and whips out their phone? You know, it's it takes seconds to load up the camera, video camera or, or just a normal camera on phones now. So they whip out their phone and they can film a fight there and then. Most places now they can probably upload it to YouTube within minutes of that fight taking place. How do you police these things? And photographs, I've done it before. Last time I went to Sheffield, sat in my seat, whipped my camera out, took a picture from where I was sitting, you know, this is my view from my night, blah, blah, blah. Then people replied, oh, yeah, I'm sat around here, I'm there, oh, I think I'm near you. How do you police that? You know, some Is a steward going to sit and watch people? Oh, he's got his camera out. You know, is it like a six second rule here? Uh, he's got it out for, for he's had it out for like ten seconds now. Is he you know, do I need to go and speak to this guy? And you know, where where do you draw a line? How zealous or overzealous or, or careful do clubs need to be in policing this and managing it? And you know, it's 
I think some of it is storming a teacup, perhaps, because it's fresh out today and, and people react instantaneously. And, you know, I've done that plenty of times to, to different news before. But it's an interesting one. It's a loaded topic. Again, I can see both sides of the story here. I'm not entirely sure which one I agree with, if I'm perfectly honest, because I do see both sides of the coin. Um, and, you know, if the league wants to be more professional and seen as more professional, then yeah, it does need to try and start acting slightly more professionally and protecting its products and protecting what it's selling and putting out there and, and the image it's portraying. And again, I may disagree with some of the stuff they put out there in relation to like fight videos and things, but the point is they think that is what they want to put out there and they want to put it out there in a more professional manner and that's part of what Seth Bennett is doing with the league and the team. So that does get compromised if there is grainy cell phone footage appearing on Periscope and YouTube. So again, I see both sides. I'm not sure which side of the camp I really sit on because there's pros and cons in both argument. Um, and, and it's really difficult to say definitively this is the right stance to take or that's the right stance to take because you know, in bigger picture terms, protecting the product is important. But equally, trying to display the game and showcase it to as many people as possible is also important and there are people out there who are doing you know they are doing good video work and good periscope and stuff you know they may hold things still and and get a decent shot and, and whatnot so you know it's not all terrible stuff and i know a few people joke that mobile phone footage can sometimes be better than than some team footage but it's a very very interesting one as i said a, a couple of times I, i'm not 100 percent sure where i stand on it yet and it's interesting to see how they enforce it and you know what the elite league do in general because obviously there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions but if they start to do more quality video content especially and get it out quickly then you know they're kind of doing their bit to fill the gap and engage with people and you see now like nhl.com was sending out gifts of goals which they wouldn't have done before but the rise of people like my regular face greg ballack and so forth are forcing you know nhl to rethink its strategy and look at how it does things a lot more teams will do vines now and instagram videos and so forth and, and this is the kind of thing the elite league teams need to adapt with as well and, and the league as a whole so interesting times obviously as i said it, it caused a bit of debate and around the elite league and social media today so i mean if you've got an opinion on it that, that you want to share you can always find me on twitter at rob mcgregor 35 or email the show on pop short at gmail.com one other piece of elite league news which uh, I, I don't know I, I don't want to do too much navel gazing but i feel like it, i kind of may have broken it i may have done and uh, is the idea that the khl might be coming to the uk now it was mentioned way back when that the khl was interested in expanding beyond Russian borders, which of course it has. There's teams from Latvia. Jokera joins the league as well, one of the biggest names in Finnish hockey. And as I said, the, the UK was on the radar. A lot of people wondered if the financial trouble that the league has had would temper that goal. But they've already said they will be expanding into Beijing and the MasterCard Centre. So there's an 18,000 seat rink there that they look to be moving into. And it sounds like that they've had applications from elsewhere. Catcher President Dmitry Chernyshenko confirmed the applications, or if that's what you want to call it, uh, at the All-Star Game last weekend. And his exact quote was, at the moment we have a request from Estonia, Sweden, the UK and other countries. And he also mentioned April. So whether that's a cut-off date for a decision, or whether that is just a closing date for applications to be submitted, I'm, I'm not sure. It, a lot of people read it as they would make a decision in April, as I said. They're expanding to Beijing already. We've got a team in Latvia, Croatia. Uh, we've got a team as well in Zagreb, Belarus, Slovakia. So, you know, this kind of may fit with the KHL's plans to expand, which, again, some people thought might have fallen over with, with some of the teams having financial difficulties, especially with falling oil prices. But it looks like there is some interest there. Where they play exactly is up for debate. Again, people have suggested Wembley Arena, which possibly make sense and there was talk of a London elite league team playing out of Wembley. Others have mentioned the O2 Arena which hosted the NHL Premier Games in 2007. I think that one may be a little ambitious to begin with because of the size of it, the cost involved. It doesn't necessarily need an anchor tenant of that type to make money. Whether AEG 
would be up for that I don't know and, and somebody kind of pointed out if the Rangers and New York Knicks weren't already anchor tenants in Madison Square Garden and they were starting afresh today would MSG let them in I know you blur the line slightly because the same group owned the two teams in the venue but you kind of take the point it is these busy venues don't necessarily need anchor tenants especially in a place like London where you know it is one of the big facilities it does hold a lot of the the big names and the big concerts there so you know, that's it's interesting to see where they might end up. I know Nottingham and Brayhead owner Neil Black was linked with starting up that London side, and, and as I mentioned before, it was expected to be an elite league side, and the name London Empress was, was banded about, which I think is a terrible name, but they seem to have registered it, and the social media accounts hovering in the background for it. So, yeah, I, and I, I'm curious to see how this pans out, and whether it's just an application. One person mentioned that maybe this is an old application from a previous planned or previous project that you may have seen a new rink built in one of Britain's cities that, that just didn't happen and that it's uh, it, it's been used as a quote by the KHL to try and drum up interest and that Chernyshenko is mentioning in it because it sounds much grander to say Estonia and Sweden and the UK than just going oh, Estonia, you know, they like a, like a team in Estonia. It, that's slightly less grand than when you pull in Sweden who are one of the big hockey nations and the UK which is a pretty big economically you know it's not quite china but we're pretty well off over here we don't do too badly for ourselves and the the deal the KHL has, has struck with workforce bank or partnership with her, sorry is also quite intriguing they're london based and the plan is to expand KHL business operations and bring more training and exhibition games to the united kingdom so that that's an interesting little agreement coca-cola russia have also got involved there's some pretty sizable companies who do put money into the khl and you, you have to imagine it would take a good size sponsorship deal to make a team work in the uk because you know the budgets are so much bigger than the elite league so they'd need that sponsorship support because you you can only charge so much for tickets i think ticket prices here would probably be higher than the maybe in places like in, like russia and, and latvia because the economic difference it's london where things tend to be more expensive anyway and they kind of can be because the earning power is much bigger there so they can kind of accommodate for it so it's an interesting one and i know a lot of people have shared the article and i'm very grateful for, for that on on wordpress.com but it's something i'm going to be paying particular attention to over the coming weeks i'm trying to find out more if i can i'd like to thank avis Callins. i hope i pronounced that right for bringing that one to my attention in the first place so uh, stick tap to, to avis and uh, yeah certainly an interesting story for anybody involved in the british game to follow because Croatian game has certainly benefited from having Zagreb join the Continental Hockey League. Just a little bit of housekeeping then before we wrap things up. As I said earlier, you can follow me on Twitter at Ron McGregor35. You can like One Puck Short on Facebook, facebook.com slash One Puck Short. The email address is One Puck Short at gmail.com. And of course, the blog, as always, is One Puck Short.wordpress.com. If you're so inclined, you can donate via PayPal to help us with our running costs and so forth. Just visit the blog, hit the PayPal logo on the right-hand side, and you can donate a pound, ten pounds, twenty pounds, whatever you think we're worth. If you think we're worth a pound, send us a pound. If you think we're worth a tenner, send me a tenner. That's brilliant. It all goes towards the running of the show. It goes towards hosting costs and our account costs and things like that and equipment and, and so forth. So it all goes back into the show. Uh, and if, you, if you'd like to help, then it's all gratefully received. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, if you can consider leaving us a review on iTunes, that would be greatly appreciated as well. That about wraps it up for this week, or for today's show, I should say. And I will speak to you all again very soon.